Well, hey, church, I'm so glad that you're with us here today. We're in the middle of this series called Bystander, and John is inviting us to come and to see Jesus, and not only just to see Jesus, but to have the opportunity to believe in him. So as we go through this series, we're looking at John's eyewitness account. We're not here to just learn more facts about Jesus, but we're here to learn to be changed and healed and forgiven and transformed by him. And that's really John's greatest desire for all of us. Well, I have to tell you something back at our house here. Our dogs have an annoying habit whenever anybody comes into our home. They accost them with wild enthusiasm. I mean, Lucy, our boxer, jumps in place in excitement. She circles your legs and she'll even bump into you and maybe even make you nervous in the sense that you might fall. Izzy, our Boston, gets up on her hind legs, puts her paws up on your leg, and just tries to keep her balance, dancing and prancing, trying to get just a little bit of attention, just to letting also you know that she cares that you're there. And if you're not expecting this type of greeting, it can throw you for a second. You're treated like a celebrity, and the dogs are like fans, and they're just trying to get a glimpse of you, just a little piece of you to be able to say hello. And now this usually ends with laughter and smiles as they're petted and shown you know, some sort of attention. But it got me thinking, why can't we all be greeted like this when we walk in the door, right? I mean, why can't we, wouldn't it be great, you know, with the year that we've had to be made to feel important and valued, you know, whenever you entered somewhere? I mean, it takes dogs to do this, doesn't it? I'll tell you what, you won't get that treatment from cats. <laughs> it's quite the opposite. They just look at you and go, what are you doing here back? I thought you were gone. Well, this reminds me of those times of people, when people meet Jesus for the very first time, Right? They get knocked around and pummeled by God's love. They feel whole inside for the first time in their lives. They see the Bible in just a brand new way. And they're strangely secure and I could even say at peace, even in the midst of great chaos. Well, John records Jesus meeting a man who was born blind. And when this man meets Jesus, he's pummeled by Jesus' love and it changes him forever. Now, a lot of us can't really identify with being blind. Maybe some of us know somebody who has been. My daughter always teases me. She says that I have man eyes. And what she means by that is when I open up the refrigerator looking for a particular item, I can't find it. And she usually walks up to the refrigerator and points it out. And nine times out of 10, it's pretty much right in front of me. And then she just looks at me and she says, man eyes. Uh, But I have a deeper blindness problem beyond man eyes. Uh, My blindness problem is a spiritual blindness a lot of times. See, I don't always see what God wants me to see. And I'm wondering if you can relate to this. I mean, I've missed my fair share of miracles that are all around me all the time, whether it's a sunset or sunrise or whether it's just a moment in conversation. See, I can get caught up in my own self, my own agenda, priorities. I mean, you name it. But I don't want to keep being like that. And God's been forming something in me throughout my lifetime But I know it's a weakness of mine that I want to be able to see Jesus. I want to express joy and kindness more freely uh, to people in my life. This is a desire of mine, and this is what God can do in us. So Jesus is going to be introduced to this man born blind, and John records this in chapter 9 of the Gospel of John. It says this, As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind or been blind from birth. Now, I just want to call a time out here in this moment because it's so important. It was this happened not in this great amazing moment necessarily or a moment where there were lots of crowds that were surrounding him. This happened just in the everyday walking and journeying of life. You know, this is a lesson to all of us. Our best moments in life will not be usually at some big event a couple of years from now. I mean, we look forward to those. But our best moments generally happen, if we're really honest, just in our day-to-day life that we live, even socially distant and in a pandemic, whether it's in a school hallway or the checkout line at the store, or maybe it's at the gym, or even in a Zoom meeting. Sometimes you just kind of stumble into these, what I like to call God moments. And they're just these meaningful, special moments that you go, wow, God planned this. This was, a, this was something that he planned in this moment for us to engage in right here or to, or to recognize. And it's a little bit of a miracle right there in that moment. Well, he goes on in verse 2. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? 
Was it because of his own sins or was it because of his parents' sins? So the disciples just looked at this man as a conversation piece, as a talking point. They certainly weren't going to engage with him. They didn't want a personal encounter with this blind man. Uh, they were going to avoid him just like everybody else did. But they just thought, well, this is interesting to talk to Jesus about. But I love Jesus' answer in verse 3. He says, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. Well, this answer was so different than anything that they've ever heard before. It's not sin. I mean, all of these uh, situations revolved kind of around that and the brokenness of the world. This is not due to their sin and the brokenness. This is rather God at work, a person who's born blind. This event that they're about to experience, though, is just what Jesus wanted them to know, was not only for, today, for that moment, that day for them to experience, but little did they know, we'd still be talking about it in 2021. This was God at work. Well, Jesus went on and he says, we must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming when no one can work. What's he saying here? He's saying it's easy to just talk about things, but it's quite another thing to do something about them, to engage in it, to make the decision, to make that phone call, to pay the debt that you have to pay or to get to work, to, you know, whatever it is. It's, it's one thing to talk about it. It's certainly another thing to do it. And think about this, you know, with all the disbursement of this past year, when somebody that we know, especially like even within our church, has lost engagement, we haven't heard from them in a while, we haven't seen them in a long, long time. You know, it's up to us to not just talk about that, but to engage with them again, right? To reach out to them, to pray for them. And, you know, anytime we do this, it obviously can add complexity to life for sure, right? Um, but this is where God works. God works in the phone calls. He works in the texts and the Zoom meetings in the coffees that we have with each other. This is how God works. And so think of how important that is to not just talk about somebody or to think about somebody, but to show them that you care. And I think this is all more important as we head into Easter. We should all be praying for people. We should all be re-engaging with people again if we've kind of fallen off of that cliff a little bit. And we should be taking those first steps because, hey, this is not going to last forever and our time here on earth is limited and people matter. This is what Jesus was saying to the disciples. Time's running out. Engagement's important. So Jesus, rather than just talking about this, he leads the way in this. And he says, we're not going to just talk about this guy we're going to do something about what's going on in his life. So John picks it up in verse 6. It says, Then he, Jesus, spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. And then he told him, Go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. And so the man went, and he washed, and he came back seeing. I mean, it's just an incredible miracle. And we read this and we go, this is unbelievable. How can this happen? You know, this man who was born blind can suddenly for the first time in his life see. Could this really happen? He healed him of blindness. And then when we start thinking that way, if, God, if Jesus could do that then, could he really heal me? Could he really help me in whatever impossible situation I'm in? And I would say the short answer to that is yes. But the question is, why doesn't it happen to you? Why doesn't it happen in me? Well, let's take a little closer look, a little deeper look into what's going on here. So Jesus spits, which is kind of gross and disgusting, and makes mud out of dirt. And then he puts it on the man's eyes. I mean, all of this is just so different than how anybody would respond to anything like this. And then he tells him to go and you know, head off to a certain area to go wash, not just right there around the corner, but he had to travel to this place to, to get washed. Why did he do this? Why did he make mud out of spit? And why did he tell the guy, go wash in a specific pool to do this? Why, did, why wouldn't he just speak and just say, you're, you know, you can see? Why wouldn't he just touch him and say, you're healed? Why didn't he do it this way? Well, Scholars believe, and, and, and I believe today too, that Jesus was really looking for a step of obedience from this man. 
He was looking for belief. He was looking for a step of faith. Will this man do something? Will he cooperate with God? See, I believe God still works miracles today. And many times there's just this obedient step that needs to be made. We need to step out in faith and to trust him and to do something. See, I believe God's love, care, forgiveness, provision, all of that stuff is available to anyone and to everyone. But isn't it true that not all of us receive it? Because there's not, you know, there's an action to take for us to do that. And so many times we won't take that action. We'll kind of just stay still in our place. So the question I want to ask you today is where do you need a miracle? Where do you need healing in your life? It could be relational, financial, spiritual, emotional. Where is it that you need a miracle to take place in your life? And then the second question I want to ask you is, what obedient action do you need to take? See, Jesus has the power to heal you. He's got the, he's got the wherewithal to do this. And so many times, though, we just hope and we wish and we pray for it, but we don't do anything about it. You know, whether it's the fact that we're in a difficult marriage and we're praying about that, maybe God says, you need to take a step. You need to maybe apologize or you need to get some outside help. Or whether it's chronic pain, you know, like, you know, let's find a way. Let's work through things. Let's take some steps. Or what? maybe you're just in, we've all experienced loss at some, some degree or another this year. So maybe you're grieving a loss or your heart is broken and you need to take a step into that. You need to acknowledge it and then you need to maybe connect with somebody instead of just doing this in isolation. Take that next step and watch God work. So verse seven, John says, you know, again, so the man went and he washed and then he came back seeing. So God still performs miracles today, but his power is usually shown in apologies, in consistent prayers, in consistent Bible reading, or even in stepping out and applying for a job, not just praying for one. Or it's, it's really a matter of just getting up and moving forward, taking a step toward him in faith. Now, does that mean that God's going to immediately solve every problem in your life? Does it mean it's just going to have this immediate miracle and everything's going to go back to being perfect? See, sometimes that does happen. God will do something immediately, but most of the time, God is really at work within you. He wants to grow something deeper in you through the everyday process of obeying. He wants to form something. He wants to form your character. He wants to develop you and develop your spiritual muscles. So, This blind man, his blindness, Jesus was saying, wasn't because of his sin. It wasn't even because of the brokenness of this world. He said the reason that he had this blindness is so that God's power could be revealed. Now, here's what's so powerful about this. You may not know why something is happening to you in your life. You don't know, you know, you, maybe something's been held back from you and you just don't understand it. But could it be that maybe God is at work? Maybe there's a purpose to this. And suddenly you recognize it and you see it and you go, oh, God's at work. See, God is always at work and he's at work, especially in the darkness of our lives. So what are the results of this man's miracle of transformation? Well, there's a few of them and I think they translate to us today. The first result in in reading John's eyewitness account is this amazing boldness that this blind man had. See, the religious leaders of the day were infuriated with the way and especially the timing of this miracle. It was This happened on the Sabbath day, and they just had religious reasons why this was not supposed to be done. Even a healing of blindness. And it just reminds me, there are so many unnecessary arguments today that can really waylay us and keep us from really the most important thing in our relationship with God. Many of them are unnecessary. I remember reading that where Paul tells Timothy, he says, don't get caught up in some of these um, arguments, you know, these social media arguments that go on all the time or, you know, cultural arguments sometimes that just don't matter when it comes really most of all to our walk with God. Some of these arguments and some of these discussions are very important, but there are some that are not. 
And so these guys are caught in, getting caught up on minor things. The major thing is this man's life has been transformed. So he goes on in verse 25. I don't know whether he's a sinner. This is the man's response. I, I don't know if he's a sinner, the man replied, but I know this. I was blind and now I can see. I mean, think about this answer to these religious leaders. It was a simple answer, yet it was so personal and profound and powerful because it was something that transformed in his life. So I want to help you here. You know, can you tell your story of how God has changed your life in 90 seconds or less? I mean, this man was able to say it in one statement. This was like an elevator pitch. Here it is. This is the difference that God has made in my life. I was blind. Now I see. So when people ask you about your faith and your walk with God, here's the good news. You don't need to argue and defend the story of creation. You don't have to be a microbiologist or an astronomer or, or even a theologian. You just need to be able to tell your personal story. You know, maybe it sounds like this. You know, before I met God, I was filled with fear all the time. Fear dictated all my decisions. But now I have peace, even in the midst of chaos. Or maybe before I met God, I was just a bitter person. Nobody wanted to be around me. But I've discovered joy through my relationship with God as I've learned that he's loved me. Or maybe for some of us, I was addicted at one point, but now I'm free. Some of us might say, I was just a prideful jerk. But after I met God, I'm not as much of a jerk today <laughs> as I was back then. God's still working on me. I mean, we could have some humor in our story as well. But it reminds me of what Peter wrote to the church. He says, if somebody asks about your hope as a believer, just always be ready to explain it. Tell your story. And that's incredible boldness because it's personal. And so it's powerful because it's you. The second thing that happened from the result of this man's transformation is that he believed. And that is so important. This is what we're talking about in this series. Remember, this man has still never laid eyes on Jesus. He's never seen Jesus up to this point in the story. He never saw him. And so this reminds You know, think about this. Belonging was his greatest need, and it's truly our greatest need still today, especially in the middle of a pandemic. We spent a major part of this year dispersed from each other, right? We're still meeting, you know, together, 
and I, I'm still meeting some of you for the first time since the pandemic began. And these are incredible moments to be able to see each other again. But there's something wonderful about reuniting, isn't there? It's just an amazing thing to be able to do that, to feel a sense of belonging. It reminds me of that Peaches and Herbs song. Remember that one from a long time ago? Reunited and it feels so good. Remember that? We are both are so excited because we're reunited. Okay, I'm going to stop. But that song is just cool because I think it has special meaning for us right now. It's just reuniting, connecting, and having a sense of belonging, whether it's in a group setting, or whether it's in an in-person service, or whether it's us right here. But there's something special about reuniting. That's why I love to call our church the Fellowship Family. It's my favorite way to explain our church because there's a sense of belonging when you're a part of this. So when you know that you're loved and you have people who are for you, isn't it true that you can handle life's toughest challenges? That's because scriptures tell us that perfect love casts out all fear. When you're genuinely loved by God and others, you don't have to be dominated by fear. But being together is so important. Having a sense of belonging matters rather than isolation. So think about this man who was born blind. He was blind, and so people thought there was a stigma attached to that back in that day, and so they avoided him. This man spent most of his life in isolation. They believed that blindness was his fault or his parents' fault. So he was ostracized from the community. He was set aside, looked past, avoided, and even ignored a lot. Can you imagine going through life that way? So many of us feel lost, don't we? Especially right now, we feel wounded maybe in our spirit because of something that has happened to us in our past. Well, God wants to heal us of that. In the deepest places of our being, in the deepest places of our soul, he desires connection. So I wonder if that's what you need this morning or this day, that you need some connection with God. You need to allow God to just kind of embrace you, give you like this spiritual hug, right? That understanding and knowing that he loves you, that he's close to you, that he cares for you, can help you through the stresses of today and especially the worries about tomorrow as well. And some of us, I truly believe, are carrying burdens within us that we were never meant to carry. Only God was meant to carry those. He's the only one strong enough. See, I believe Jesus wants to meet you and I in this moment right now. And I hope that you're sensing and experiencing a God moment in your life right now. The God who loves you and the God who still wants to perform a miracle in your life. If you'll believe and you'll obey him and take a necessary step toward him, it can be so powerful. It reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew 11. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and you carry these heavy burdens and I will give you rest. That's what he wants for you today. I hope this resonates with you right now and that you'll allow him to do that in your life. Let's pray here in this moment. Heavenly Father God, we just thank you so much for your promise and for your power that you promised to each one of us. God, you see us all and you see the needs that we have and the burdens that we carry. And in this moment, Lord, we just want to think about a burden that we're carrying right now, a need that we have, a miracle that we need uh, for you to heal in our lives. And we want to just admit it to you. So in this moment, would you just say what that is, whether it's just a phrase or a word, just say that and give that to God in this moment. And God, if there's an action that we need to take, that I need to take, a step that I need to take in order for you to perform this miracle, uh, in my life, would you give me the insight? Would you give me the spiritual vision to see it? And would you give me the strength and the courage to step forward? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.